Hey everybody, welcome back, and thank you all for the support. Uh, definitely keep liking, subscribing, commenting. I really have enjoyed, you know, hearing people be like, hey, you could have done this play differently, or, you know, this is a different build, and it's just, uh, it's why we, it's why any content creator does this work, and on that note, I'm going to have an article coming out pretty soon with slingspells.com. I uh, reached out to one of the lead folks there said hey i really want to write something about ral i think there's a lot to say and uh that should be going up sometime this week so feel free to hop on over there and check that out and maybe i'll see if i can get that link at least into the discord for mtg spell slingers for those of you who are on there and i think today i just want to go into the state of the format the state of the meta um you know there's a lot more discourse about you know ral seems to be the top tier deck you know, is Domri also a top tier deck? Can Teferi, Jace, and some of these other control decks, even Sarah, address them, right? Or is there room for adjustment within the meta? And I think it is a healthy meta from what I've seen. I think some other folks are feeling that way. But for myself, um, I've enjoyed playing the top tier decks. I've also really enjoyed playing the decks that are not quote unquote like top tier and tuning them. And I think green and white both have a lot of tools to really change the way the matchups play out. Um, and I just felt like it was a good chance to really go over uh, the top two decks. And I would say the, uh, you know, another deck that a great content creator pushed out there um, and just wanted to feature because I thought it was like a very different flavor of what a lot of people are playing. And uh, I really enjoyed it. So I think with that, I would love to just do a couple quick deck techs, talk a little bit about the strategy and about how the meta is shaping around them and uh, looking forward to just getting into this with you all. So let's get it. This is my, you know, slightly iterated build that I put on the channel. Um, I'm really happy with it. I'm sure there are still card choices um, that could be made that are different, even in the article that I wrote. I basically listed multiple things that you could change about RAL and play around with. But this is the list that I've really found to continue to be explosive, continue to interact with other decks, you know, in a profitable way, and just be really consistent. Um, and the main change is playing Extract Sample. Uh, so deal two damage to an enemy creature. If it lives, you get a base copy of that in your hand. So it's it's just another way of interacting with the board as removal. But also, sometimes what you're doing is you're just getting a free card off of your damage spell and then finishing it off with a burn through or a shock or a warding flame, right? And just the card advantage to be able to say, cool, I'm going to make your creature work we weaker, and then I'm going to get a copy of it, and then I'm going to kill it. Um, and it costs two, right? So it'll be free with Ral's passive. It's just extremely relevant. And uh, as you can see, I know, I was doubting on the old Delver of Secrets, one of my favorite Magic the Gathering cards. But time and time again, I've been playing this deck, and especially when you're on the play, you've got one mana, so you don't have the Fragile Mana Gem. What are you doing on turn one? And the answer is nothing, usually. You know, you're not usually dropping a, a one mana spell or like a spark of genius on turn one. It just doesn't make any sense for the deck. But Delver is just, to me, the perfect turn one play. It's a creature that benefits from all the spells in your deck. You're only running four creatures, two Thing in the Ice, and two Delver of Secrets. So it's going to flip. It turns into a 2-2 flyer, which is perfectly serviceable. And it pressures. Sometimes even off of Isochron Scepter, you'll get like random spells that upgrade your your creatures and like your Delver becomes a threat now. And they have to deal with that and Thing in the Ice and Magnum Opus. So, you know, I think the community has really tried a lot of different RAL builds and I've just been really happy with this one. Um, I think that it, you can get card advantaged out if the game goes a certain way, but usually if you were low on cards as well, or like you're behind on cards as well, like you're probably losing that game anyway, if you don't have them very low. 
So I just think the more consistently explosive and pressuring to your opponent you can be, that's where I want to be. Also, uh, you know, I dig that people like Logan Thorne have said, like, Rooftop Laboratory is a busted land. I, I didn't see anyone playing this until fairly recently, and I've been testing with it, and I just really, I feel like it's good. I feel like it's the reason that Rao can kind of go over the top even when they're down on cards because there's going to be a turn that doesn't interrupt your curve where you're going to have your draw step and two extra cards in your hand to really push the game, uh, to close out the game, I would say, in most cases. So Delver, originally I thought was underwhelming. I think it is just the perfect thing to do on turn one, and you always want to be up-tempo and pressuring your opponent. And I think that Extract Sample has a lot of uh, dynamic gameplay to it. And I think as the meta adjusts to Rel, I think that it'll be interesting to see, you know, whether it's a combination of reach creatures, creatures with high toughness, you know, creatures with other abilities. Extract Sample might be really good into that. So, you know, the way this deck plays is you're just exploding off of turn one or turn two. Um... You know, one thing I'll say is when you start playing Rao Mirrors, things get more complicated, especially when the builds are different. And something I learned recently, I would say, is when you're not playing against Rao, typically I will play Thing in the Ice on turn two, or turn one if we have the Fragile Managing. And that's because, you know, we can easily flip it, you know, the next turn. You can't do that against Rao, right? And may maybe this is just me not having that awareness, but you can't do it because odds are they're going to be able to deal three damage to this thing and kill it. So if you're not flipping it on the turn you're playing it, you're probably losing tempo or you're losing on card advantage. So that's just like a mirror consideration. Extract the sample, very good in the mirror, right? Because you can get a, a piece of their, you know, Awoken Horror, or you can get an extra Mizium Monstrosity, um... And it's just, it's more ways to interact with your opponent. So I, I think it's really great. And I just, I've really liked Delver, especially in the mirror when people are not running it. And that's only because I want them to point their shocks at this. Yes, Warding Flame can hit it. But I'm okay with that because the main threats I want to live are Thing in the Ice and Mizium Monstrosity. So if people are, you know, finding that Delver is pressuring them or... You know, they, or if even if they don't hit their removal in the early game, it's going to be harder for them to also deal with that as a threat. So, this is the build that I would really just, if someone was like, hey, I want a competitive top tier deck, and, you know, someone who's played enough games on it to kind of know how it operates, this is what I would recommend. I think Ral is S tier, as most people have been talking about in the community. It's consistent, it's powerful, it's explosive. People will adjust to it, and the deck will need to adjust. And I think the first consideration is maybe a mid-range version. So I'm going to flip over to that real quick, just so people have an idea. Where you run School of the Wizard, right? And maybe you go back to the old school, like you've got some figments, maybe Pyroclasm, because you're a little slower. You've got Rune Show Crab on the ground, and maybe you're running Show Game Lava doesn't have to be Lava Axe, I think I just kind of threw that in, or Opportunity to get um, Elemental Mastery going, right? So this deck probably has better card advantage and longevity versus an aggro Rao list, right? So this is just an example of how you can shift the build to be even more optimized, right? Because if people are going to get more aggressive or, you know, put in more spot removal, whatever else, great. You go over the top of them, play School of the Wizard, and every time you spend six mana in a turn, you're getting a 5-4 unblockable elemental, right? So if you are if you do find that you're hitting a wall with what you feel is the top tier deck, right, like with the going back to the aggro version, you might want to consider, okay, maybe I need to shift some cards. Maybe I need to shift my strategy. And one way to shift that, if you happen to have School of the Wizard, is just go a little bit bigger. Go a little bit more mid-range. Um, and, you know, really think about your card choices and, and what you feel 
in the field is the best way to address uh, what you're seeing. Like if I see, you know, a bunch of rattles or a bunch of rascals, like whatever it is, and I'm just seeing a ton of it, after probably two or three games of playing into it, I'm going to go back into my deck and I'm going to start tuning. Because if I'm going to keep getting matched into them, I want to feel like I have, I'm adapting and I'm finding ways of, you know, adjusting to the decks I'm seeing the most. So uh, I'd love to hear in the comments, you know, what has been successful for other RAL players. I'm really excited for folks to check out the article when it drops because uh, I just put a lot of time and effort into it and real big RAL fanboy, <clears throat> which I know some people may not like. Um, as, a, as a person who played Dragon Storm back in the day, I definitely love the Storm uh, variety of deck. So that's what I got for RAL. I, I just think... If you feel like you have not tried this deck, or if you've just been like, is it really that good? I assure you, this deck is very powerful, it's very consistent, and it just doesn't take a lot to get ahead with this deck, or to be incredibly explosive. So, And I encourage anyone to just build it with the cards you got, and I'm telling you, it'll, it'll likely still be very successful in Mythic, um, or on the climb. So, alright, let's put Rao away. We've, we've been a rail fanboy for a while. Gotta head over to my other my other favorite right now, Domri. Um, and it's funny because really early on into the meta, or into the climb for Mythic for this last season, people were calling Domri, to, like Wolf Domri, to be good. And I didn't really know why until I played into it. And it's also explosive. There are also different ways to build the deck, but I, I would encourage most... People who have not played this variety of deck, I would start here. And the reason is, is it has a level of consistency. And there are play patterns that I think are relatively intuitive. It does take a little bit of adjusting with the werewolves. But um, I also like that it's got these kind of different win conditions, which I do think gives you a little bit more versatility. And, I do, and the other explosive part of it is Gaia's Cradle. So if you haven't played with this land... Right, what it basically says is starting on turn 7, you have a chance to get like a bunch of mana, depending on how many creatures you have on the board. So if you're if you're always just generating creatures, right, which is Domri's whole thing, then you, on turn 7, right, instead of having 7 mana, could have, you know, a maximum of up to 12, right, if you have 5 creatures in play. And that's probably a pretty powerful thing to do when you have cards like Lava Wave, Overrun, and our new Beastie Boy, Crater Hoof Behemoth. Right? Five, eight mana, five, five haste. Give all creatures on your side of the battlefield and in your hand plus two, plus two, haste. Um, and this, this is one of the premier reasons why you would play something like Gaia's Cradle. Um, but let's get into the nitty gritty and I'm definitely going to throw this deck up on the channel. If I get a chance to this week, I would love to. If I don't, you'll definitely see it next week. And I, I just think that whether you hate or love Ral, whether you played it a lot or whatever, if you want to try what I think is the other S tier deck, I think this is a good place to start. So Sundancer, 1 mana, 2, 1. Okay, fine. Moonlight. Flips if you end your turn with two available mana into a just a 4-3. So it's a 1-mana 4-3 with a slight cost attached to it. Now, a really important interaction I'm going to point out now is that if you have a trap card, right, how traps operate in the game is it basically, it looks like you've unused your mana on your turn. That's like your opponent sees you and they're like, oh, they still have three mana and they pass the turn. Most people are pretty wise to that there's a trap going. But the interaction between traps and werewolves is that this says unused available mana. That counts trap mana now. I don't think it did before, but then they hot, they fixed it. So if I go Sun Sun Dancer, this is on let's say turn four. I go Sun Dancer for one, prep my Worms Wake trap, and that uses those three temporary you know, those three mana. Sundancer flips, even though I have paid to play a card because it's a trap card, 
and it wasn't triggered on my turn, the game says, oh, you have unused mana, right? So there's some inherent synergy between the werewolves and traps. Now, the only trap I'm running is Worm's Wake. I think it's reasonable to maybe think about giant growth, or maybe there are even other traps that you know I haven't really seen in green or red that you know synergize with the werewolves even more. I don't think you want to get too hung up on this synergy, but it's just a really good interaction to know when you're playing the deck. Channel over might auto include. It's a one mana two two. It's often going to be a one mana three three, and the reason that's important, right, is like okay, thing in the ice has three toughness, right? Uh, they see a monstrosity has three toughness, and so when you slam them with a grudge match or a blindside, which I don't have in this list, or an Ulvenwall tracker where you fight something, you're going to take out their really important creature. So I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Now, Birds of Paradise, <clears throat> you'd be like, why do you want an 0-1 for one mana in an aggro deck or like a mid-range deck? But getting free mana is what enables these werewolves to, to flip very early. Right? So you can go Birds of Paradise in turn one, play Sundancer, flip it immediately. Crows and Tusker, if you're playing green, you should probably be playing this card. It's just a two mana, four, three. Not, nothing much more to say about it. Now we've got a one mana Elvish Infuser. I think this card has been underrated and is just incredibly important in a lot of uh, green strategies because of how fight operates, right? Like, fight will leave damage on your creature even if you kill their creature. So giving something plus O plus 2 is very relevant uh, on a 2-drop. And we're running one um, off of some lists that I've seen, and I so far I've been pleased with it. I, don't, I haven't really felt like I needed two, um, and I, I think that it's, it's just kind of enough. Grudge Match... Every green deck should be playing this card. And the reason why, you need to answer Thing in the Ice if it's unflipped. You need to answer Mizium Monstrosity if it's, you know, not gotten bigger. You have to be interacting with your opponent on turns two and three in a RAL meta. Period. Gatstaff Agitators. This card I read originally, I was like, how is this playable? But I, I don't think I really understood. So it's a 3 mana 3 1. You get a fragile gem. And when it flips, it becomes a 5 1. 5 1 is not much better than 3 1. Um, but you get another fragile mana. So you can play this on turn 3, get the fragile mana, pass the turn, and then the next turn, you know, it's either ramping you to something or it's going to be really easy for you to pass back and flip it. And just getting the Fragile Mana means that you can sometimes just play Lava Wave Overrun or Crater Hoof Behemoth on turn 6 or 7 without hitting Gaia's Cradle. So it's just, it's really a helpful card into what you're already doing. Oh, I want to talk about Herman and the Flock here for a second. This card is the reason I think that aggro is going to have such a hard time into Domray. It looks really innocuous. It's the three mana one four that yes, when it comes into play, gives you a one one body as well. But when you flip it, it becomes a four four and you gain two life for each sheep. Usually you're just gonna gain the two. You're not gonna likely have a second sheep. But getting a four four and a one one and gaining two life for three mana, I mean, what could you ask more for? I mean, you know, this is why Chandra probably can't be doing what she's usually doing because this is such a roadblock and such an advantage when you're playing mid-range into aggro so i mean this guy is just does so so much work in these decks and for domri it counts as two bodies right because you've got hermit and you've got the sheep so that's two towards your creature count so it's inherently synergistic tracker if you're playing a johnny if you're playing domri I always felt like this should be in your deck because it does what you want it to. Open Wall Tracker counts towards your creature count for Domri, and in Najani, it counts towards your buff count, right? So it's just inherently synergistic with the passive. And again, it's a three mana, three two that interacts with the board. You have to be interacting with what your opponent's doing if they're playing 
thing in the ice and and also just into other aggro strategies you want to be interacting with the board so the tracker is just a really great option worms wake not too much to say here efficient card synergistic with werewolves should probably be, be running it um i have not gotten to play the general all that much because actually i didn't have enough to craft it and then i farmed the events recently which were excellent i really hope they keep doing that um just so that we can all craft our stuff without spending money um it's just really good right it's a four mana five four if it gets to attack you're just getting a, a free two two and you're buffing everything in your hand just a really solid card <clears throat> no reason not to run it in my opinion and then we've got a cool new kid on the block in blight of four and I, re I remember reading this and i was like this seems good but maybe it's too slow maybe it's just not that great and i would say most of the time this thing is just closing the door on your opponent when you're resolving it when you're attacking with it after any fight this gets plus two plus two it's a four mana five fight. it's just a big beefy boar who's going to really either shut the door on your opponent from attacking just a lot enable your attacks better enable your fight spells can't ask for too much more and i love this guy daybreak ranger i was really excited when this came out because i just love the way that the card operates it seemed too slow but that was into a chase meta when we don't live in that world anymore baby so the green players get to have a little fun so the play pattern with this pretty much always is going to be play it when you have six mana and it's really easy when you play birds of paradise or gat staff agitators you're going to play this you know with four mana and maybe two temporary mana Right, and what you're going to do is you're just going to take any creature that has five toughness or less, you're going to play this, and you're going to instantly kill it on their turn when you pass with two mana up. And then you get a 5 4 reach that has ward still. I mean, it's just like the perfect interacting four drop for the deck. I mean, it's not really a four drop, it's kind of like a secret six drop because of the way it operates. You can play it on turn four because it does have ward, so they're not going to be able to kill it immediately. This thing is just such a house. 5-4 reach is really hard to deal with. It, you know, being able to instantly flip and deal five, like it's a free blind side on the opponent's creature for five damage. It's, it's again, just incredibly powerful with what you're trying to do. Clearing the board, buffing your creature... It's a great werewolf. If you haven't crafted it, I, I really think you should. Ulrich, just great. 5 mana, 5-5 five, five haste. When it attacks, you're getting a free creature. When it flips, upgrades, becomes a 6-6 six, six trampler. You know, the, I think the ideal play pattern is play him on turn 5, get a free creature. Then, attack. you know, hope, enable an, a second attack, get another creature. Somewhat ideal. Um, and then pass the turn let them flip an upgrade but just know that you can play this on turn seven right or when you have two unused mana not attack if it's a bad attack and then just flip it into a six six trampler and buff your team and maybe that makes the difference right maybe you need a creature with flying maybe you need a creature with ward a creature with a lot of toughness he could potentially give you that out right so that's just something to think about centaur sage Again, another card that was just a little too slow in the last format. Six mana, five, five, draws you a card. Often, what you can do is just go Centaur Sage, Birds of Paradise, or Centaur Sage, one of the boars that you get from Dahmer's passive. Um, often, when you're playing this card, if they don't answer it, you're just going to run them over. Um, and I, I think it is a good choice for the deck. So, let's talk about the end game for this deck, because I think there is room... For diversity and the diversity is how do you want to close the door what do you want to play around right so let's start with the the most noteworthy card in crater of behemoth right i think it's very likely that this deck could run two of this card i don't see why not i do think that you want to limit how many eight drops you have in your deck though because you don't want to disrupt your curve too much because they're going to sit in your hands until turn seven most most time most of the times maybe you get a lucky turn six but that's that's pretty unlikely i think and 
this card is just usually winning you the game on the spot, and if it's not winning you the game on the spot, it's pretty much closing the door. Buffing your entire team plus two plus two and all cards in your hand when you're just constantly refilling with boars from Domra's passive, from Centaur Sage and other other value creatures. It's just going to be really hard to deal with this. And sometimes, and I would say in most of the games, when it's coming down, it's just it's just winning the game. So you could play two, you know, have a higher chance of getting them. Like I think if the meta shifts towards maybe Teferi or Jace or something that can deal with um there the thing is although there are cards that kill creatures there aren't many cards that like counter creatures so i do think that creator of behemoth is kind of like the premier win condition for creature decks because there's not like too many ways you can interact with it um at least when it's coming down so that might make Overrun and Lava Wave worse, but I do like having these in the deck as sort of like diverse ways to close the game out. Lava Wave, I just know having played other mid-range decks into this, you're just on a clock. Once they get to turn seven or play, you know, play this out with their eight mana that they've got, I don't think you're winning, right? It's just wiping your entire board. They still have their board, right? And then there's Overrun, giving everything plus three plus zero oh, and Trample. I think all three of these usually just close the door pretty much instantly, and they're set up by all the value, the mana generation, and all the clear, clearing their creatures. Um, it's just it's a synergistic deck, but it's running powerful cards, and it just doesn't really require a lot for you to close out the game, like to run away with the game. I think the only thing that I would advise anyone who's playing this into aggro is like you can lose to aggro decks. It's very possible. If you're not setting up your turns to maximize how many creatures you have in the board, if you're not setting yourself up to have that turn six Daybreak Ranger to answer their threat, you know, knowing that this is going to have reach, right, and be bigger on the other side, knowing how to sequence Tracker or Hermit of the Flock to keep yourself alive, you should not lose to aggro, but it's still possible. And I think conversely, when you're playing against Control, they can still board wipe you, right? But who cares if they board wipe you on turn seven, on their turn seven, when you're getting them low the whole time, and then you could just slam a crater huff off the top, right? Or like redeploy some creatures the following turn um, and then overrun, right? So when you're playing against control, just be mindful of how many creatures you're throwing out there. You have to be pressuring them. You should never not be pressuring them. But you should sort of take note around like turn five, six of like, okay, how is this going to play out if they answer these threats? Are they going to have to Day of Judgment? If they Day of Judgment, what is the likelihood that I win this game? I think I said it in my other aggro videos. You need to pressure. You have to force them to have the spell like Day of Judgment because if they don't, you're going to win. And if they do, you are calculating for that and you can maximize your ability to win afterward. So... As you can tell, I'm pretty excited to talk about this deck. I just think Domri is a, a lot of fun to play. I was experimenting with like an aggro Domri build. Um, you know, I'll just throw it up. Why not? Just just in case people are curious. When Ember Spawn Crag was zero mana, I was playing a like low to the ground Domri deck. As you can see, got a bunch of one drops. We got some two drops. We're just clearing blockers. We're th throwing hasted creatures, and we got Beast Keeper who is buffing all of our cards that cost one or zero. Um, which, at first, I like wasn't sure it was powerful enough, but it did. It, it felt pretty powerful. Then you got Hollowhenge Avenger for card advantage, and it's a trample. It's got five power to buff Channeler of Might, and then Hell Rider. So, uh, you know, I wasn't actually planning on talking about this deck, but I do think this is a viable option, too. Maybe it's not as good into Rel just for the sheer fact that they can answer your early creatures, um, but I do think it applies a lot of pressure, and I think it is a variant of the build. I do think Ember Spawn Crag is inherently synergistic with Domri's passive, right? And sorry, I should go over this for those who haven't played with him. Every five creatures you summon, you get a f you get a one mana three two. So it's just anything. So th that's why Beast Keeper is cool because it just automatically buffs them. Um, and you just want to be dumping out creatures, pressuring, 
getting more card advantage through things like Tracker, Beastkeeper, through the Ember Spawn Crags. But I haven't really played with this list since the nerf to Crag, making them cost one. But I, just looking at the deck, I still think it's probably consistent and strong enough. I Really what this was tuned for was the Jace meta, where you had to be fast as heck. And so I just wanted to put a bunch of one drops and twos and threes, and I wanted my one drops to have more value, and that's why I put Beastkeeper in the deck. So, I don't know. If you're finding yourself into a bunch of control, you might want to get the aggro variant a shot. But just to to sort of close out this segment, I think if you're gonna start with Dominant Midrange, I would start here. I think you will find a lot of success. It's just gonna be you know, really playing out your werewolf turns to maximize your mana is going to be, you know, take a little bit of getting used to. Um, and I think you can tune it. I think you could, you could put blindside in the deck. You could put uh, the 2-4 Elvish Archer in the deck if you're finding that you just really need, like, a big toughness on a creature and the ability to have reach. And uh, I think you're going to have fun doing this. I have felt a little bad playing against a into a lot of the aggro decks um and i think dom Ray has game absolutely into rail um although you will have hands just saying where you might have like four five eight right where you like mulligan your hand and you just get a bunch of big costing cards nothing you can do about that that will happen to you sometimes but for the most part you're just gonna if you ever have a reasonable curve with the deck it's going to be really hard for them to stop you. So uh, that's, a, that's what I like to call Big Dumb. Um, so I think I want to close out today uh, just going over a pet deck of another streamer who's been doing pretty well on the ladder uh, with it just because I want to try it out. It's a different strategy. Um, before I do that, you know, I think decks like Sarah to Fairy. Um, even the like Liliana zombie combo thing, I think that can also sometimes just win. Um, you know, I think the white decks have a lot of game into uh, Ral specifically, but also Domri. I think their removal could be very impactful, uh, very cheap. Their card advantage and their life gain can be very you know hard to deal with. Um, I I again I want to I want to caution by saying like, oh wow. You know you're you're misplaying if you're not playing Dom Ray or Ral. Those are consistently top tier decks, but everything else are just marginally different, and you can tune your deck to beat these things. So if anything, you know I would encourage everyone who's watching this go into your collection, look at the Planeswalkers you've got, and say, okay, do I have green Planeswalkers? Hopefully, do I have white Planeswalkers? Okay, what do I like playing? How do I deal with Thing in the Ice? How do I deal with a turn six or seven Crater Hoof Behemoth? You know, what What can I do to slow things down or speed things up? Am I the aggressive player? Am I the mid-range player? Am I the control player? Right? You always want to be asking yourself that question when you're deck building. So without further ado, let's get into a fun pet deck that I've really appreciated. So this is from... Uh, N Roshi one <laughs> or Narash. Uh, they're they're a uh, streamer. Just shout out to them. I've enjoyed watching their streams when they were playing this deck. Um, <laughs> the one thing I don't have is a second Ether Figment, so there should be a second one. I just stuck a blind side in here because I was like, I like removal, so let's give it a shot. Um, just a really cool build. Uh, I think they got to like top ten on the Mythic Ladder with this thing. And, you know, when the conversation becomes, you know, really just repetitive around, like, two decks, naturally I'm going to be like, all right, there's got to be other stuff that's viable out there. And I think there are so many things that are viable. And I don't hear a lot about Kiora, so it was just really exciting to see a build that someone was not only succeeding with, but having a lot of fun with. So let's go over kind of the main strategy behind the build. So we're running Tolarian Academy. And this is Nerf Tolarian Academy, right? Quote unquote. Um, you know, it's it's very different from what it used to do. But basically, your Thought Provoker is free. Your Travel Supply is free. Your Isochron Scepter is one. Your Manipulator is cheap. Um, your Decorative Armor, which is a card I've never seen before, 
they were playing this, uh, I probably wouldn't even even given it a second look. Um, and I just hats off to them for like finding this card and utilizing it because um, there are so many cards in the game that are like not staple in a lot of lists, and I just love the creativity here. And that's that's what I'm hoping to bring to the channel myself. You know, with with uh, just really getting in, digging deep, you know, with a cup of coffee and looking at some lists. But um, it's a cool card. I mean, it costs three when you play Academy. So uh, you're just playing three, and you're getting three charges of a 3-3 three, three haste. So it's just a way to pressure your opponent um, in, in these colors. I just think that's really creative. Traveling Supplies, if you've seen my Drist videos, you know how I feel about this card. I think it's underrated, and I think it's very, very good for aggro and mid-range strategies. I, th I think it's, you know, maybe essential. Tasty Morsel, you may be thinking, I'm not playing Vraska. You can play this card outside of Vraska. It got buffed to be a one mana two one that buffs a creature in your hand. It's just, you know, relatively solid one drop for green. Um, you've got Unsummon. If you're playing blue in this meta, Unsummon should be in your deck. Why? Because you want to bounce their already awoken horror. You want to bounce their Mizian monstrosity that's going to hit you in the face for 19 damage next turn when they play 10 spells while you sit there. You gotta be interacting with the board. On someone's a great card to do it. It's cheap. It's it's what you want to be doing. Ice Crown Scepter. It's gonna cost one mana, and you're gonna get two spells. Card advantage, excellent. Now this is a cool pet card. I, I was really hoping someone would be playing this. Ambitious Scholar. It's a two mana one one. So you're like, okay, this is bad. But it flips when you play an artifact into a two mana five three. <laughs> which is pretty wild um, stat line for a two drop. And uh, it can really pressure your opponent, you know. Just play this on turn two, play any of your free artifacts. You know, Thought Provoker's also, you know, sitting there and making your deck a little bit cheaper, which is cool. Um, it's, just a, it's just a fun blue card that, you know, wasn't really seen play and I think has a great home in this deck. Um, you know, imagine you just get to go Scholar, Turn three, you play a, a Thought Provoker or Supplies, and then you grudge match something and smack them for six. It seems awesome to me. Tarmogoyf, obviously going to have a good home in a deck that's playing artifacts, spells, traps, creatures. It's it's just going to be a good, a good player for you. Tusker, grudge match. So just take note, if you're not a green player, notice how Colonial Tusker and grudge match were in... <laughs> three of the three green decks that we played tonight, so... Or, or that we talked about tonight, rather. So I would really consider these pretty highly. Um, Adaptable Frelmec, I also was hoping this card was going to see the light of day, because it's a two-mana three-one that you get to draft an upgrade for. You know, I always felt like drafting an upgrade for creatures that were three drops, four drops, five drops was powerful, but it was still kind of slow. But a two-mana three-one that could be like a two-mana three-three. A two-mana... 3-1 sneak, a 2-mana 5-1 um, that you need for some reason. Um, it's cool. It's it's a cool 2-drop for the deck. Um, Icy Manipulator, I really love this card now. You know, I, I don't know if the consideration was to have this for Ral, but it shuts off Awakened Horror, it shuts off Monstrosity. It's excellent in that way. Ether Figment, you probably should be running two of these. Don't, don't follow my build. Um, it's just a free card, and you have so many ways of enabling it. Um, cool. Let's let's talk about buff Buffaloing Merfolk. I almost couldn't say that. Uh, a three mana three three that affects the board doesn't, you know, it doesn't seem crazy, right? It's like we talk about these explosive decks, these explosive lines of play, but it's just a very efficient card interacting with aggro and mid range. You know, you get a three three body. You make their best creature worse. And it just can enable some really great ways of allowing yourself to survive that early game and to scale into the late game. Blindside, again, I put it in because I didn't have one of the other cards. I don't think it's a terrible include. Again, I think if you're finding that you just really want more spot removal that's efficient, Blindside's fine for that. It's a little... Three mana is a little bit more. I think you just... Absolutely want to play on summon. Absolutely want to play grudge match. And I want to go back to this for a second. That's why I think this deck 
has some really great game. You're playing two of the premier blue and green two drop removal spells in unsummon and grudge match. Having access to both, I think, is very important. And probably why this deck is somewhat successful, right? Worm's Wake, again, nothing much to talk about here. Three mana, five, five. The trap buffs Tarmogoyf. Um, it's just, it's a big boy. It's going to help you fight things. That's what you want. Decorative Armor, again, <laughs> uh, uh, just hats off. I think it's a cool card. Um, it does what you want it to do. It puts the body in play. It gets you card advantage. It's pretty cheap with Academy. Enough said. Oh, love that this is seeing play as well. Dungeon Geist. I believe Buxfu, shout out to you, um, had been running one copy, maybe two copies in Gideon, um, which I think is a good home for this card. But I, I also love it in this deck, and I just think that in a world where people are playing, you know, where you're playing against Rel and you're playing Awaken Horror and you're playing Mizzy Monstrosity, you're playing a Dungeon Geist, although it's not the easiest to protect, um, is great. It's a 2 2 flyer that's going to lock something down, hopefully. Um, and uh, if anything, it's going to draw some removal out from your opponent. And uh, it can be just a huge, huge tempo play. It's just another way to slow things down and sort of, you know, craft the cur, you know, the sort of um, tempo of the game the, the way you want. Momir Vague won't come as any surprise to anyone. It's just a efficient four drop. You're getting, at minimum, four four worth of stats. Uh, sorry, five five worth of stats plus an upgrade, because it's always going to get plus one plus one. So. If you played a bunch of Rel or Domri or some of these other meta builds and you have not gotten to touch this deck yet, I highly encourage you to do it. I think there's even other customizability within it, but it's just a really cool take on Kiora. I mean, who would think to only play up to four drops in this deck, right? I mean, I think when people saw Adaptive Frill Neck, they were like, okay, maybe we'll fill out the curve, maybe we'll still play the 3-3 the three, three crab, but this is just full kind of Kiora aggro mid-range and uh, I just I really it's really creative and I think it's really interesting and fun and it's competitive it's doing what the meta you know requires you to do which is to interact early to have enough card advantage to go late and to put down enough pressure that if your opponent stumbles you're going to get through so again you know I talk about modal decks on this channel and the more modal your deck can be the aggressor, the controller, the mid-range, the more you're going to be able to maneuver in the said matchups. Um, so I think I will just kind of, you know, close out things there. I'm really hoping to get some more games in. Um, I would love to hear from other folks, like, are there specific decks you'd like to have more information about? Or are there specific builds um, that you want to go over, specific Planeswalkers that you're hoping to? I think, again, the kind of only Planeswalker that doesn't seem to have much game is, uh, sadly, Mr. Ashiok. Um, too slow, too ineffective. Maybe you could do it. I would love to see that. Um, but for now, I really, you know, just to sum things up, if you want to win games of Magic Spellslingers, play Rel, play Domri. If you want to get creative, if you want to beat those decks, if you want to be the the scissor to that paper, then go for it. Play Grudge Match, play Unsummon, play some of the white, you know, destroy creature traps, um, play creatures with high toughness, play cheap creatures that, or cheap things that can interact with the board. You can tune your deck to beat this meta. Um, so I think it really depends. Like some player, I've, you know, playing Magic for 16 years, I would say I like to play the deck that beats the best deck. It's kind of flipped now because I've been playing a lot of Ral and Domri. Um, you know, some people prefer to play the quote best deck. Some people prefer to beat that deck. And some people prefer the rogue decks, right? Which are just like have maybe game against both or against one and, you know, like to answer one deck over the other. The cool thing about this game is there is just a lot of deck diversity, a lot of build diversity. And I think, you know, if you're really just finding yourself frustrated, I would, you know, 
take a breath. I would look at the planeswalkers you have access to, and I would just really sit down and be like, how can I make my deck cheaper, interactable, and modal? You know, uh, how can I lower the curve of my deck potentially or make my curve better? How can I interact with the board? How can I make my deck have game against aggro, mid range, and control? Um, and sometimes you can't answer all those questions, but uh, that's what testing is for, and that's what you know, just uh, getting in there and slinging some spells and seeing what works, you know, what sticks, what doesn't. Um, you know, that that's one of the best parts of these games. So I uh, really appreciate anyone who's you know stuck it out through the whole video. Um, let me know what you think. I uh, love doing these kind of deep dive things. I'm hoping to do more writing. Um, I, I think it's a really fun way to, to talk about the game. And uh, I think we'll sign off there. Happy holidays, everyone. And uh, just, you know, take it easy. Enjoy, you know, uh, have just uh, as good a time as anyone can. You know, sometimes the season can be tough for folks sometimes it's happy sometimes it's it's a big old mix um but i i really have appreciated you know producing content these last couple of weeks and uh, looking to do even more in the new year so with that take it easy and uh we'll catch you next time